I received a message this morning by email um, through YouTube, and the person has since deleted their comments, so I'm not sure if they got their question answered. But I think this is probably a pretty common question and something that's very new to people who have uh, been listening to pastors their whole lives or, or are even new to Christianity because no one's really talking about this. And so the question is, would be interested in knowing the context of you mentioning those going up in the first resurrection and being martyred. I'm no expert and I'm no, I'm a nobody was just wondering. I know a lot of carnal Christians are waiting for a rapture. And I know Greek scholars who mentioned Jesus rising was the first resurrection. So was wondering personally, I know I could go any moment or martyred, but also know the book of Peter mentions the end coming through fire, Second Peter 3, 10 through 11. If you posted a video on it, point me to it. I try to keep up, but may have missed it. I really appreciate this question. And if you, if you deleted the message and found your answer, cool. If you deleted it for any other reason, all questions are great. I'm, I'm so happy to do a video on this and do really appreciate when you guys ask questions. So I want to address a few things in here first before I go into the martyrdom. Um, the first uh, that I want to address is the issue of rapture. So rapture, by the way, that word is not in the Bible. Rapture comes from the word raptura, which is a Latin word, and the word was not written in Latin. It was written in Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. So if you know that the word was not written in Latin, then you know that somebody else is putting a spin on this and whose language is Latin? That's the Harlot Catholic Church. And so any doctrine around that, you know that the person is already not speaking on the authority of God. They're speaking on the authority of the harlot. And so I wouldn't take anything that they say seriously. If they can't even use the language that God used for his own event, I would not take that seriously. Rapture proponents use two scriptures, two in order to try to say, in order to try to validate their argument of pre-tribulation rapture. And they can't even use those two scriptures that they're saying supposedly are translated into raptura. They have to do this roundabout and go to the words harpazo, or the word harpazo, in which there are two contexts where harpazo was used. And so this, then they say, well, it means caught up. And because there are no other scriptures with which you can compare, uh, because there are no other scriptures that are using this language. By the way, harpazo was not used to describe the first resurrection. Harpazo, the concept of being caught up, is used to describe what will happen during the resurrection. So it's an aspect of the resurrection, but not the resurrection itself. And in one context, it's not even talking about the resurrection. I can't remember the other context. In any event, Contrast that with the 52 times that the word uses resurrection. And then you got to ask yourself, why are we talking about, why are we using this word that doesn't, that is not the same word God used for his own event. And it doesn't reflect what's going on in God's event. And also, by the way, we talk about the resurrection of Jesus and we talk about our resurrection to Jesus in the first resurrection and then we talk about the second resurrection. And then there's the definition of resurrection, which is, by the way, does not mean those who are actually going up. Even in the first resurrection, God's people are going to be resurrected to him. But everybody is being resurrected. And all that means is that they're coming to life. Everyone in their tombs. If you were cremated, you're coming out of wherever you were sprinkled your graves, whatever, you're coming to life. That's what resurrection means. Those who participate in the resurrection are those who are going to meet Christ in the sky. Likewise, in the second resurrection, it just means those who are coming to life and they're being given an opportunity to be saved only as one escaping the flames, not someone who's going to receive an inheritance or a reward. And Ezekiel is very clear about that. When you look at Ezekiel 44, 46, you're going to see... 46 in particular, you're going to see that there's a distinction between the sons of God and the servants of God. So there are some who are allowed to work in the temple, but there are others who are sons of God. And you see that if 
Jesus, if the prince decides to give a gift to a servant, it reverts back to him during the year of freedom. If he gives a gift to his sons, nothing is to be taken from them. So they have an inheritance, whereas those being saved as one escaping the flames do not. Now, if we're using God's language and we see that there's the resurrection of Jesus, him coming to life, and of course he did rise to the Father, and then you see that there's a first resurrection. If there's a first resurrection, there's got to be a second, huh? And there is. And the second is when the rest of the dead, as mentioned in Revelation 20, the rest of the dead who did not go up in the first resurrection, also who are not of the false prophet, and who did not receive the mark of the beast, because those are in the lake of burning sulfur. They immediately go into the lake of burning sulfur. There is no chance for them. But there are others that John describes, and, and he says they are the rest of the dead who were slain by the double-edged sword coming out of Christ's mouth. The rest of the dead who didn't fall into those three categories, false prophet, the beast, or those going up in the first resurrection, they will rise in the second resurrection after the thousand years have ended when Satan is unbound and he goes out to deceive yet again in the four corners of the earth. These are those who are being given an opportunity to be saved only as one escaping the flames. Now, Paul talks about them in Thessalonians. Excuse me, I think I also always say Thessalonians and it's actually 1 Corinthians 3. Verse 10, by the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care for one, no one can lay a foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. Okay, so he's already given us this category as one escaping the flames, only as one escaping the flames, not one who has a reward or an inheritance. Now, here's why I always say Thessalonians, because here in the context of First Thessalonians 4, we find, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Okay, so we know there's a first resurrection. There's also a second resurrection. That is what Paul is referencing here. What Paul is not saying is we who are still physically alive, because you have to understand that everyone is going to die. And I'm going to demonstrate that for you when we talk about the martyrs. None of God's people are going to be alive physically when Jesus comes. None, not one. So Paul is referencing spiritual life and death not physical life and death. Let me read it again so that you can hear it with that perspective. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. When the word says falling asleep, it's usually referring to death. What they're talk what he's talking about right here is that you've died in Christ. Literally died in Christ as a first fruits offering or a kind of first fruits offering. You see in James 1.18 that he says he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we may, might be a kind of first fruits of all he recreated. You see in Revelation 14, verse uh, 4, they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. These are the witnesses. You know that they die. First fruits always referred to when you're dying. Okay, so we see, uh, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, now he's talking about spiritual life, who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Okay, let me help you understand what this means. We who are still alive, who did not die in Christ, you did not fall asleep in Christ, you were not martyred. Paul's including himself in this. Why is Paul including himself in this? Because he's alive at that time. He hasn't been martyred yet. Those who were still alive. So there are people right now who are physically dead, but they didn't die in Christ. They were not martyred for Christ. I realize that this might seem, uh, without the rest of the context of scripture, it might seem like I'm putting my own spin on it. 
So hang with me because I'm going to read to you other scriptures so that you can understand that what I'm saying is true. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord. Why is he saying we're still left until the coming of the Lord? Because they haven't died yet in Christ. They haven't died for Christ. We'll certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, who have died for Christ. There's a difference between just falling asleep and dying versus what he said at the end of verse 14, in which he said, God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Yes, we die to ourselves when we're in Christ, but that's not the context of what we're reading here. The context of what we're reading here is fallen asleep in him. We are referring to martyrdom. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. So the dead in Christ, those who have died in Christ, fallen asleep in Christ, are going to rise first in the first resurrection. Now I want to explain the kind of first fruits of all he created. This is referring to the multitude in white robes, uh, to all those who will be saved that are not witnesses or apostles. They are con considered the other martyrs who are included in the multitude in white robes. So he chose to give us birth through the, through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. So that's a kind of first fruits. And here in Revelation 14, when talking about the witnesses, the 144,000, the two witnesses, quote unquote, two lampstands and two olive trees, uh, that they are purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. So this is first fruits to God and the Lamb. The others are a kind of first fruits. All right, before I go on, I want to address this question, these other questions here. So they had said, and I know a lot of carnal Christians are waiting for a rapture. Yeah, it's nonsense. Paul already told us, I don't want you to be unsettled that uh, the resurrection is not going to come until the abomination of desolation has been set up. We know what time that happens because we've been told in Daniel 12 that at the beginning of the seven-year period, the witnesses are testifying. They're referred to as the sanctuary and the daily sacrifice. They, they testify for 1260 days. God is not reestablishing a physical temple when he's told us repeatedly in the New Testament that we're the temple. And he's also not reinstituting sacrifices to disrespect his son's sacrifice and lead you back to the law. So their sacrifice is the daily sacrifice, 1260 days. They're killed in the middle of that year. They rise three and a half days later, which is a day to year prophecy at the same time that everyone else who goes up in the first resurrection is going to rise. Rapture proponents, they're talking about something that's going to happen before they have to endure anything. I'm going to read to you all of the scriptures on persecution. That is a ridiculous, uh, unbiblical, irreligious position. And people will fight that ideology to the death, and I don't care. I just block them from the channel because they're liars. They don't care about truth. Then he goes on to say, I know Greek scholars who mentioned Jesus rising was the first resurrection, so was wondering, absolutely not. The first resurrection is if you go, and, and I want to empower you to look this up yourself. So if you go into a Bible app like Bible Gateway or, or you know, if you don't do apps, then go on the website of Bible Gateway, type in resurrection so that you can look at every context of resurrection and what is being said about it. It's impossible in the first resurrection for Jesus to be up in the clouds saying to us, come up here. I mean, that's just ridiculous. Yes, Jesus rose first. He was the first fruits to God, to the Father, and we, the, the witnesses, are the first fruits to God and the Lamb, and the multitude, and, and the witnesses die in the middle of that seven-year period. As the word says, the temple is thrown down, and the sanctuary is thrown down, and the daily sacrifice is abolished. That's referring to the witnesses. Multitude in white robes, still here. They are referred to as a kind of first fruits. Even though... Uh, there is a group of people that's going to, there are a group of people who are going to go up in the first resurrection. Not all are receiving the same reward. Jesus tells us, I will give to each as they have done. Not all are receiving the same reward or inheritance. So you have different categories of people, but yes, everyone who goes up in the first resurrection will be sons of God, priests of God, and will reign with him for a thousand years. And their, their salvation will be irrevocable. No one can take it away from them. 
So I, I have, this is the first I've ever heard of it, but I mean, nothing shocks me. Greek scholars who mentioned Jesus rising in the first resurrection. Wow. Uh, that's just really incredible. I don't know how they can even call themselves scholars. It's not that difficult to look up every context of resurrection and see that there's a distinction between Jesus resurrection and our resurrection and that Jesus in the book of John is talking to, you know, when he's talking with, I think it's Martha. And Martha says, I know he, Lazarus, because this is uh, Lazarus's sister, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. How are we going to say, like, Jesus is coming on the last day and uh, he's being resurrected at that time? That's just silly, right? And then again, in verse 25, he says, of John 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. So they're referencing an event that's going to happen in the future in which all are going to rise in that, or all who are his are going to rise in that resurrection. And, by the way, in the second resurrection, there will be more who will come to life and be saved. If they pass that other test, because for a short time, Satan's going to be unbound, and he's already been triumphed over, so it's not like God is throwing him a bone. It's, he's going to be unbound to go out and deceive. And so it's obvious that people are going to be tested during that time. Not those who've gone up in the first resurrection, but those who went up in the second resurrection will be tested at that time and given an opportunity to fulfill their covenant and be saved only as one escaping the flames, no inheritance, no reward. Now, one caveat to this that I want to tell you is that in Revelation, we're told that people are either, whoever doesn't have the seal of God, whoever is not uh, going to be martyred for God during these end times that we're living in right now, Whoever does not have that will go into the burning lake, the lake of burning sulfur. They will receive the mark of the beast. So these second chancers, so to speak, who go up in the second resurrection are not living during this time, at least once that fifth trumpet blows and the witnesses have been killed. No one repents at, from that point on. Uh, we see that in Revelation 9. So no one should be taking this for granted and thinking, oh, I just want to be saved, so I'll just... Uh, be a second chance her. Nope, not going to happen. You've either got the seal of God and you're bearing the fruit or you'll receive the mark of the beast. All right. Now I want to address this issue of the end coming through fire. And then, then I'll start talking about the martyrdom and uh, the persecution that God's people are going to endure. So the book of Peter, he says the book of Peter mentions that the end is coming through fire. Second Peter three, 10 through 11. Let's look at what it says. 2 Peter 3, verse 3. First of all, I want you to know that in the last days, men will laugh at the truth. Uh, sorry, I'm reading from the NLV. I'm not used to this version, but it was the first thing that came up. Um, they will follow their own sinful desires. They will say, he promised to come again. Where is he? Since our early fathers died, everything is the same from the beginning of the world. But they want to forget that God spoke and the heavens were made long ago. The earth was made out of water and water was all around it. Long ago, the earth was covered with water and it was destroyed. But the heaven we see now and the earth we live on now have been kept by his word. They will be kept until they are to be destroyed by fire. They will be kept until the day men stand before God and sinners will be destroyed. Okay, so first of all, God said he made a covenant with, uh, with Noah that he was never going to destroy the earth again by water. This time it's going to be destroyed by fire. And you see what the word says here? They will be kept until they are to be destroyed by fire. They will be kept until the day men stand before God and sinners will be destroyed. So the, the, the earth is not going to be destroyed by fire until that time. Let's see when it happens. Revelation 6, verse 12. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. The heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? All right, so we know when this is happening. This is happening at the end of, of the 45 days uh, that lead up to the, re to the resurrection, to the seventh trumpet blowing. When the abomination of desolation is set up on the 1290th day from, the, from when the witnesses are killed, so the latter half of the seven-year period, 
the very end of the seven-year period. And then there's another 45 days. Blessed is the one who reaches 1,335 days. That's what it says in Daniel 12. We know that during that time that the son of man is going to be revealed and the man of sin is going to be revealed. There, it's going to be a time of destruction that the world has never, ever seen. We're told that in Matthew. Jesus told us that. So when you see standing in the, pla- in the place where it ought not be, this is going to be a terrible, terrible time, a time that the world has never seen. Okay, so let's read about it. Matthew 24, verse 15. So when you see standing in the holy place, the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to get anything, to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. God's people are still going to be here, guys. His his people will still be here. This will be the time where uh, people are being forced to bow down to the abomination of desolation, which, by the way, I don't believe is a physical thing. It is something that's being set up in your heart. Uh, just like the mark of the beast, whatever you're bowing down to in your heart, that's what you're bowing down to. doesn't have to be a statue. I mean, come on. Jesus has already told us nothing that goes into the body defiles you. It's what's coming out of your mouth because it's coming from your heart. He's already told us that we're going to be justified by our hearts. So this is not, I, I don't believe that this is a physical thing. Carnal Christians like to say, oh, I'm not going to take the jab. Oh, I'm not going to uh, take a tattoo. Oh, no one's going to tattoo my forehead. I mean, come on. How stupid. Is it that easy? I'm not going to take a chip. Wow, you must be so righteous. How about the rest of these things? You going to ingest Christmas, Easter, crosses, images, statues, nativity scenes, the chosen, passion of the Christ, false doctrines? Oh, that's different, huh? Yeah, it turns out it's not that easy. Turns out that Jesus wasn't, you know, stumbling on his words when he said it's a narrow door, not a wide one. All right, so we know what, at what point he's talking about because the, Daniel has already told us, or Gabriel th- through Daniel has already told us that the 1290th day is when the abomination of desolation will be set up. And then he says, blessed is the one who reaches 1335 days. So we know at that time, that's when God's people are going to be slaughtered by the Antichrist system. The reason this period of time is not the Antichrist reign is because God has risen from his dwelling and you can't have God reigning and Satan reigning at the same time. So his reign is ended, but it doesn't mean he doesn't have power. And Daniel 12 tells us that the power of God's holy people is going to be broken during that time. That, and the, and the word revelation tells us that he causes those who do not receive the mark of the beast or worship its image to be killed. It doesn't say some are killed and some are not. It says they're going to be killed. Now listen to what Jesus says about those days. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. Okay. So, I mean, it's only 45 days, so it's been cut short. I don't know that there's any other interpretation to that, but that's how I understand it. He's only done this for 45 days of his people being here. And he says, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. Now, if the, sake, if the elect have been pre-tribulation raptured, why is he saying that? Because uh, the jig is up. There ain't no pre-tribulation rapture. He hasn't shortened those days for the wicked. He's shortened them for the sake of the elect. Otherwise, they would not even survive. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, there he is, or out in the wilderness, do not go out, or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it, for as lightning that comes from the east is visible in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there's a carcass, there the vultures will gather." Now listen to what he says. Immediately, so he's quoting the prophet Isaiah, I believe here. Let me see. Yep, Isaiah 13. Uh, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. So we know what time we're talking about in Revelation 6. Let me read it to you again. I watched as he opened the sixth seal. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red. And the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs drop from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. Let's go back to Matthew. Let's make sure we know what time is he talking about immediately after the distress of those days. What are those days? The 45 days. That's what we're talking about, right? The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The the stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Let's go back to Revelation 6. Well, what else does it say about those days? All right, so he said that he's opened the sixth seal. 
There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black like sackcloth made a goat hair. The whole moon turned blood red, and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as figs dropped from a fig tree when shaken by a strong wind. And then he says, the heavens receded like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So God's starting to destroy the earth. Do you see that? And he's bringing his wrath on the wicked. But I don't want you to think that this is like an instantaneous thing that's happening. You have to understand that God's fire really is judgment. So I don't know that like the entire earth is going to literally burst up in flames, but the flames of God rather, right? So even when he's killing by the sword, double-edged sword that's coming out of his mouth, what is the double-edged sword? It's the truth. It's the word. And so he's convicting. Like, I don't know about you, but I'd rather just go through it and like be burned to death than to be convicted by God for eternity. And then the smoke of my torment rises forever and ever. That is torment. At least physical death, you know it's going to end. But the torment that they're going to experience is not temporary. It's eternal. The smoke of the torment of their torment is going to rise forever and ever. So then it says, well, we've just talked about the heavens receding like a scroll being rolled up and every mountain and island is removed from its place. We know that Peter is saying that the earth is going to be removed, uh, destroyed by fire, but we don't know if that's talking about like literal fire and or the fire of God, like the judgment of God, God as a consuming fire. Then the kings of the earth, I mean, okay, let me, let me kind of bring it to you this way, okay? We are told that God made the earth by his wisdom. Did he get like a, did he have special tools to make the earth? No, it was by his wisdom. It was by him, his power. He doesn't need carnal things in order to create and he doesn't need carnal things in order to destroy. So maybe that kind of helps to like wrap our heads around this abstract idea of how God's going to destroy the earth and the wicked in it. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and everyone else, both slave and free, hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who can withstand it? Okay, so this continues to go on. And then in Revelation 21, there is a new heaven and a new earth that's seen. Okay, now this isn't seen until after the thousand years, the uh, t- the second resurrection, and then the judgment of all of the wicked and of Satan. So I'm not exactly sure how these steps are going, right? And again, I don't know if he's saying like the earth is physically going to be destroyed by fire. I mean, if, if I can imagine the things that God has said about the wicked, uh, there is definitely going to be destruction. I mean, the, the wicked are going to be ravaged. They're going to be starving. They're going to all kinds of things are going to be happening when they're here. Then Babylon falls. But listen to the way that he describes the new heaven and the new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and, and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Listen to how he describes it. Coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. Okay. Okay. So the earth, by the way, land, the earth, we've been described as that. Right here, we're being described as Jerusalem. So when Peter is talking about the earth being burned up, he could very well be talking about the wicked and what goes along with the wicked. It's not like, you know, in God's kingdom, you're walking from one room to the next. But God has established these things in order for us to understand spiritual things that I don't even understand yet. So at what point does this, is this like finalized, (laughs) you know, the um, destruction of the world? No clue. It just says the earth is destroyed by fire. And so that, you know, and that the wicked are being destroyed by fire. And so we just stay with that and we wait and God will reveal uh, during the time. I hope to God we're looking from heaven and we're, none of us are here during that time. All right. This is shaping up to be a long video, but it's interesting. I mean, at least it's interesting to me. I hope it's interesting to you. (laughs) All right, so 2 Peter 3 has told us that that fire is reserved for the wicked. Another thing that you want to consider is that in Revelation 11, when the witnesses are killed after those three and a half days, which a lot of times people people will interpret because they're not looking at the entirety of Scripture and they're not sitting in the council of God, they will interpret that the witnesses are coming like at the very end. Well, Amos tells us that God does nothing without warning through his prophets first. Why would he hand you over to the Antichrist uh, before he sends his prophets and then be like, hey, judgment's coming. Uh, And people will be like, yeah, I think judgment's been here. 
You know what I mean? That's just stupid. The witnesses come at the beginning. We know that. We know that from a few different contexts. From Daniel, where it talks about the temple and the sanctuary being thrown down and the daily sacrifice being abolished. Three and a half days is a day to your prophecy when it says that in, in Revelation 11. Uh, we also know that from, the, uh, from Revelation 12. We understand that by the function of the witnesses. The function of the witnesses is that they are testifying and they have not shrunk from death. And so when the fifth trumpet blows in Revelation 9, what's going on is that Satan's been cast out of heaven because the two requirements for his triumph have been fulfilled. We're told what those two requirements are. Number one, the blood of the lamb. That's why Jesus said, from the time of John the Baptist until now, heaven has been exposed to violence and violence, violent people have been raiding it. What was John the Baptist doing? He was saying, make way for straight paths for the Lord. He's coming, he's coming. Repent. Do you think that Satan didn't understand that the first requirement was gonna be fulfilled? He knows God's law. Okay, well, right now, since 2022, Pentecost 2022, which was May 18th, not, not, uh, not based on a Saturday Sabbath, come to find out. So we're into the seven-year period. The witnesses are halfway, more than halfway done. Thank God. Do you think Satan's upset? Yeah, he's upset. Revelation uh, 12 tells us that, that he's freaked out. And so there's war going on in heaven right now, as I do this video, as I speak, for the past... Uh, what is it, a little under uh, 12, excuse me, under two years. War has been going on in heaven. Do you see it happening down here? Do you see that Satan is able to claim those who serve him, those who have not chosen Christ? Yes, he's the accuser of the brethren. He is standing before God day and night right now. As we speak, as we live and breathe, he stands before God accusing the brethren day and night. And He's taken some of them. And you see that in, this, in the trumpets, in trumpets one through four. Another reason we know that the witnesses are going to be here or the time period during uh, when the witnesses are going to be here is because the 144,000 are sealed before the first four trumpets. If they're coming at the latter period of the seven-year period, why would they be sealed during the first four trumpets? Why in Revelation 9, when the fifth trumpet blows, are you seeing that that star has fallen from heaven? Well, what is that? It's Satan being kicked out of heaven. Hello, it goes along with the rest of the word. Satan's being kicked out of heaven. He has the key to the shaft of the abyss. He goes down into the abyss. He opens the door. Smoke rises. And as you see the language in Revelation 11, you see that this, when the beast rises from the abyss, he will overpower and kill the witnesses after their 1260 days of testifying. During the 1260 days, he cannot touch them. He is like a rabid dog right now being held back. No offense to dogs. Okay, so we know the timing of the witnesses. It's irrefutable. Anybody who wants to argue that, I mean, you better have a really good case because I'm pretty certain of what I'm doing. I know exactly what God has done in me. He confirms it on a daily basis. Okay, here's what I say. This is shaping up to be a long video. Let's do it in two parts because I don't want people to, I want them to be able to sit and listen to this and really absorb it because it's important. These are the times we're living in. It's not like, you know, God gave us a word that he doesn't want us to understand. The, the word should be understood. And so if you're just being exposed to this for the first time, I want you to really be able to soak it up and pray and ask God, is this true? Um, I don't want you to be saturated with information. So I'm gonna do this in two parts. I just want to make sure here that I've answered all of these things or that I've addressed all of these things. So would be interested in knowing the context of you mentioning those going up in the first resurrection being martyred. That's what I'm going to talk about in the next video. Um, I know a lot of carnal Christians are waiting for the rapture. I address that. I know Greek scholars who mentioned Jesus rising was the first resurrection. So was wondering. I address that there. That's just the craziest one of the craziest things I've heard. But I've heard a lot of crazy things. Uh, let's see. Peter mentions the end coming through fire. I address that. All right. So next video, I'm going to talk about the first resurrection and the martyrs. That is going to be a very, very important video. If you don't know what you've been called to suffer, you're not going to be ready. You're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be prepared. So it is really important. And I know this is hard stuff, but I really want to encourage you that as you're listening to continually pray Search the scriptures, test what I'm saying, and pray and ask God to turn your heart to what you need to suffer. 
I want you to understand that it's not just a matter of being like, oh, well, I'm just going to, you know, the big thing is that I'm going to be killed. No, that's not it. Okay. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you right now, the way that I suffer on a daily basis, being killed is nothing to me. And that's actually saying a lot because I'm, I already know from scripture that I'm going to be jailed for 10 days and I'll probably be tortured because that's what the Antichrist did the first time. By the way, Antichrist is not a new thing. The Antichrist has been here. The Antichrist just isn't in, in, in uh, reigning right now. But actually, the Antichrist has power right now. They're just not reigning. The Antichrist, if you look into Revelation 17, you're going to see that the Antichrist was, now is not, but is going to rise again. So that's impossible for this to be a man. Hello? The man of sin is Satan. The Antichrist ultimately is the spirit of Satan. But many Antichrists have come. These are those who are of Satan, who are of his synagogue or church, who serve him. And the word does not describe them as like what you think of from the church of Satan, whatever that is. It's laughable. It's a joke. Caricatures. The church of Satan is actually in the word being described as those claiming to be in Christ. These are those who are going to come to him on that day and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we eat with you in your name? Didn't we drive out demons in your name? And he's going to say, depart from me, evildoers. I never knew you. That's Satan's church. Those thinking that they are serving him. The harlot Catholic church and the prostitutes that bore out of her. They continue in her prostitutions. That's why God established a prostitute so that you could understand what a prostitute does. She fornicates with everything. No discretion, no discernment as to what belongs to God, as to what belongs to Satan, as to what is clean or unclean. She is a prostitute to everything. It's just a catch-all. Well, I think that Jesus, well, I think that God, well, I do this because I'm, I'm worshiping God. But hey, listen, God didn't tell you to change his Sabbath to Sunday. God didn't tell you to do that. I confronted my Mormon bishop, my childhood bishop, uh, uh, you know, not that long ago. And when I asked him about these prostitutions and why he teaches them, why do you teach Easter? God said to observe Passover. What is a bunny? I don't see that in the word. I don't see anything about a bunny or one day. What I see is that you observe according to his calendar. And if you're observing, then eventually that question of the calendar is going to come up because you're going to be like, am I really observing on the right day? And he's going to start revealing wisdom to you. But you know what he said to me? Who cares what we call it? That's wickedness. That's a prostitute. Well, why are you observing Sunday Sabbath? Well, Jesus rose on Sunday. First of all, he didn't because Sunday is not in the Bible. God's calendar and his days are defined by the moon, not by the Harlot Catholic Church. Second of all, the word says to observe a seventh day Sabbath. So why in the world are you observing? Why did you make that rule up? And my question is, who told you to do that? Not the word. I know who told you to do that. The Harlot Catholic Church. And so all of these prostitutes, they hate their mother. They'll talk all kinds of trash about her, but then they'll continue in her prostitutions. Seventh day of Venice. Where'd they get a Saturday Sabbath from? What was Saturday in the Bible? Where'd they get Christmas and Easter from? Where'd they get that cross from? Constantine the fake. But they'll talk about the Harlot Catholic Church being the Antichrist all the time. But you know what they never address? The prostitutes that bore out of her. Okay, so wake up, Christians. Wake up. You need to know the truth. If you're going to be saved, it's the only thing that matters. So you go to him if you have not already and you ask him if I'm of him and if what I'm saying is true. And if if he tells you that I am of him and what I'm saying is true, then the things that I'm telling you you need to do are also true. Because I don't know any example in scripture where God says, this is my servant. Only listen to three quarters of what they say. Show me one. Show me an example in scripture where he says that. He's either going to testify to me or he's not. And so if I'm telling you that these are the times and this is who I am, and he says, this is my servant, then what I'm saying is true. So make sure that you're getting that confirmation from him that I am of him. I'll see you in the next video.